The following program is a UWTV classic. From the University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection with Al Page. Our guests are Donald Graham, publisher of the Washington Post, and Mortimer B. Zuckerman, chairman and editor-in-chief of U.S. News and World Report. How much of publishing is a business and how much is a craft or an art? Well, you know, it is like a lot of other things. It is a combination. You can't really separate it out and say it's 43% of this or 62% of that. Um, in my judgment, the essential driving force, the locomotive of uh, publishing, is the editorial product. And everything else follows. If the editorial product works, you will then get the readers. And if you get the readers, you will then get the advertisers. And that's generally the phasing in which it's worked, and that's exactly the way it worked for us. Once we reorganized the book and redesigned the book and improved the quality of the book, uh, we were then able to show dramatic growth both in circulation and in the quality of the circulation, that is, in the demographics of the circulation, the quality of the readership. And once we had that, we then got a tremendous resurgence in our advertising. Um, which we had last year and again are experiencing this year. And that all follows just as surely as, you know, A follows B and B follows C, or C follows B and B follows A, depending which way you're looking at the alphabet. Let's talk about the editorial process for a moment. How do you decide, how do editors decide how much space each story deserves? Do you fight those things out? Well, sure we do. Every week we do it. Now, our whole rethinking of the magazine was to focus not on news events, uh, excessively, but to use news events as a hook on the basis of which we wrote stories that were primarily dealing with underlying trends and analysis of those underlying trends, so that we decided that, in fact, television can give you the news event faster and with a certain different kind of drama that you can do it on the pages of any kind of magazine, but we could uh, interpret it and uh, take a much longer view than you could on television or indeed in newspapers. And the back of the book, which is, there's a front of the book which is sort of politics, international politics, business. And the back of the book, now in Time and Newsweek, the back of the book tends to be entertainment and cultural things and theater things and, you know, Madonna and Mickey Mouse and... You're not big on Madonna? We don't do any of that. We stay away from that. In the first place, if you want to have a cover story on Clint Eastwood or Madonna, you'll find they're more interesting when they're being interviewed by Barbara Walters. So we focused on something called News You Can Use, which essentially deals with the issues that affect people's everyday lives, life management issues. And whether it's the best colleges or the best medical care, and where you can get it and how to understand it and how to deal with allergies or um, uh, how to deal with fitness or where to invest your money or how to handle your home, these are the things that affect people's everyday lives. This you don't get on television, so there's real value added but the that the readership gets from the back of the book as well as something from the front of the book, which is still the key to the book, that they don't get in other news media. Or at least they get some of it. We obviously deal into a news environment. At the same time, we're talking about adding four-color pictures. How do you decide what pictures to put next to a story? Well, there are different kinds of pictures. There are pictures which, in a sense, illustrate the story in visual terms. Um, but there are also pictures which express an editorial viewpoint, because pictures convey a message. And uh, you have to just look at what is available in the way of photography and what you are looking for. So you have to pre-plan, in a sense, some of the photography you take. If we are doing a story, for example, which we did, which was a remarkable story and was based on access that no other Western journalist had been given, which is to the Soviet military. Well, we knew in advance that we were going to do this kind of story. What kinds of stories would illustrate what we were about and what kind of pictures would illustrate what we were about. And we planned this out in advance. And we ran this story and it turned out to be one of our most successful issues in the magazine. Is there a natural conflict between writers and editors? Writers always want more space for their stories. There's a, an even greater conflict between writers and photographers. What do we need the pictures, say the, edit, the <laughs> writers? I mean, all they have to do is read our words, you know. No, the pictures are too small, say the photographers. The picture proverbially is worth a thousand words. And you have to balance it out. And it becomes ultimately a question of taste and judgment. And when you say, what stories do we pick? Well, we have a certain idea of what this magazine is about. We are not everybody's magazine. We are for 
we are a magazine for people who are very serious about news. We provide a lot of facts, a lot of information. We try and present it in an extremely fair-minded way. We are death. I am, in particular, very tough-minded about opinion appearing as news. We think we have an audience that is educated and informed enough that they can make up their own mind. We don't want them to feel that we are telling them what to think. We have an editorial page for that. I write the editorials. And we try and separate the editorial from the analytic and news reporting services that we provide. Writers often see the end result of decisions and then write a story. Can writers really understand the motivations behind the decisions? Well, sometimes they can. By and large, in my judgment, if you're talking about personal motivations, it's very difficult. Uh, I don't believe that writers can find out what really motivates somebody on the basis of a one-hour interview or a two-hour interview. I mean, a psychiatrist will tell you it will take him two years of listening to somebody four hours a, a, a week on the couch before he begins to understand somebody. I don't believe writers can do that. But I think they can be analytic in the sense of trying to figure out, for example, in terms of politics, where the, who, who benefits, you know, um, uh, it's the old phrase in, in law, you know, uh, who benefits and who loses. Uh, so you can get some sense of where the motive is on the general assumption that people will generally try and uh, go for what benefits them, or at least, uh, as the old uh, saw goes in Hollywood, it's not enough that one person succeeds, it's that his enemies must fail. So you have to look at it on both sides. Let's change the subject. You came into this business from the business world. Did you find people in the media viewing themselves as being better than people from the business world? Oh, I think there is no question but that uh, the world of journalism thinks that uh, it uniquely is entitled to comment on the events of the world because it uniquely knows about the world. In fact, of course, um, a lot of journalists have been essentially observers all of their lives, and they haven't been people who've done things. And uh, I can tell you that from my experience in the business world, we actually have to do things. Uh, there is a difference. I had a wonderful experience in that a particular project which I was involved with in my other life as a builder of buildings. Uh, the project that I was involved with in New York was approved uh, and it appeared on the front page of the New York Times. When I came down here, a number of the journalists congratulated me. I said, isn't that terrific? I said, you don't understand. I now have to build the building. I mean, there is a difference between when it appears on the cover of the, or on the front page of the New York Times and building it. Now, that is a whole other world and your choices are not always perfection and other choices. The choices sometimes are all bad, or two or three are moderately good, and two or three are moderately bad. Journalists tend to compare you to some standard that, frankly, is not generally available in the real world. And it is that realism, frankly, that I try and introduce between the covers of U.S. News. Do you think because of your background, it's been particularly hard for you to be accepted by the profession? I think it is always hard for an outsider to be accepted within the boundaries of any professional world, number one. Number two, it is particularly hard because as a businessman who actually uh, bought the publication, U.S. News, not to own it but to work on it, uh, this crosses several serious boundaries. One is, what right do I have to be involved in something that involves news? I mean, I have just been in business doing something, you should pardon the expression, that is so awful. I have been making money. It doesn't even matter how I did it or what I did. But in fact, my whole background has uh, been uh, such that, as I said to them, it is more surprising to me that I ended up in the real estate business building buildings than it was uh, that I ended up in the publishing business uh, editing a magazine. And I can understand it because a lot of people who've worked for years in publishing didn't uh, enter publishing at the level of editor-in-chief of U.S. News. So it's perfectly appropriate and understandable that uh, this position is not going to be accepted unless I prove myself in editorial terms. And that's going to take a period of time. I think people would, in the, in the journalism world, would be completely understanding if they thought I bought the publication just to make money or to be invited to some fancy dinner party. But to actually work on it, I have to prove my, my own abilities. And so I generally tend to focus on those stories where I have the authority of knowledge. The Columbia Journalism Review called you early on an intellectual real estate developer. Did you ever figure out what that meant? Well, I frankly cannot figure out what many of these journalism's review, journalism reviews mean on almost anything. But here I suppose what it means is that 
Uh, and there's something I have to tell you uh, implicitly pretentious about that, because it assumes that if you are in real estate or in business, that you do not have intellectual interests. In fact, a lot of people that I know in business have enormous interests in intellectual and cultural worlds and do very well at them. And just because their professional lives are more in the business sphere than directly in these other worlds does not mean that they aren't informed about them. As it happens, I have been very active. I mean, I taught at Harvard for nine years. I taught at Yale for three years. Um, I taught city planning. I've been involved in politics, and I've been involved in the medical world. So I've had, uh, along with many other people in business, an involvement in the wider world and a serious interest in it. I mean, I read a lot, and I actually read a lot before I knew I would be involved in U.S. news. And I know a lot of people in business who actually read. I know that's shocking to people in journalism, but it actually happens. You've taken a lot of heat for hiring and firing editors. What do you think of that heat? Well, in the first place, um, what you are doing is following the conventional wisdom that you read in certain newspapers. The fact is that... Not to mention the Washington Post. The Washington mm -hmm. Post in particular. The uh, Washington Post, as you know, is a competing newspaper and owns a competing news magazine. So we tend to look at them in certain skeptical terms. But even beyond that, just to deal with the specifics of what you talked about, the uh, nine... 19 of the 20 leading editors in the magazine are top editors in the magazine have all come in in the last three or four years. Uh, basically, only two have left. Um, and I think that's a pretty good record because these are not people whom I have worked with before. Um, you don't really know people until you work with them, and you don't know whether they will work in relation to the other people, even if they are talented in and of their own right. Um, so I think actually the, the basic editorial staff have actually been here since I brought them to the magazine. The managing editor, the executive editor, the two managing editors, the senior editorial staff. And uh, frankly, as the magazine sort of went from level to level, we've also tried to bring people in who are talented enough to not only manage the magazine at its, at, at its existing level of talent, and abilities, and, but to bring it to a whole different level of quality. So there is change, and there's going to continue to be change. And as long as I am determined to continue improving the magazine, there is bound to be change in the editorial staff, and I'm sure they recognize it. Um, and that is the way it works. People argue that you're driven, that you want perfection in everything that you do. Is that a fair statement about you? You know, I think it was Winston Churchill who said, I, 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 I really am satisfied with anything that is perfect. Of course I am driven by the desire to improve things. I am realistic enough to know that, A, you can't improve them overnight, B, you should move very slowly and very steadily, and C, that, that as soon as I stop being dissatisfied, I am in trouble. Um, every time I look at the magazine, I think we could have done better. And I'm sure we could have done better, even though I think it's a superb magazine. And my, I hope I never lose that ability to be dissatisfied. Is it a character flaw to be driven, or is it a real advantage? Well, I, I don't know what you mean by driven. I, I guess I don't experience myself as being driven. Others may look at it that way, but I think I have a certain energy level uh, and a level of interest in what goes around in the world. Uh, about me and in the world that isn't about me. I mean, that I find myself perpetually curious. So if this, to some people, rep is represented as being driven, um, uh, I don't feel it that way. I think I am also capable, and have been since I was a teenager, of doing a lot of different things simultaneously. In fact, I find that that is what makes my work interesting. Now, to other people, it looks as if I'm doing a lot and therefore I'm driven, but to my mind, um, that is the joy of it. I mean, I consider myself lucky to be able to do all of these things. And I find also that at the end of the day, I play squash virtually every day at the end of the day. And I can blow out of my system whatever has accumulated during the day, and I have a perfectly good time. I can vacation well and relax well. When I'm working hard, I work well. Are you mentally different than you were three years ago? Do you find yourself growing each year? Well, one of the great things about being involved in a news weekly like U.S. News is that you are forced to learn a lot about what is happening in the world. I mean, you have to have a window on the world. I read, for example, very differently than I did before because I now read uh, both for my own column, my own editorials, and for the magazine to see what interesting facts are there that I haven't seen anywhere else that I might 
use either for the stories we're doing or to get ideas for stories. So you look at it very differently. You have a functional view of what you are reading. And because you have that sense of how can I use this rather than isn't this interesting, it just increases the intensity and the concentration with which you approach any reading. So in that sense, I have read a lot and I have learned a lot. For example, I never knew anything about the Soviet military structure until we decided to do this major series on the Soviet military. I read the four leading books in the field and about 25 articles on it. I then went there and I met the secretary and interviewed the secretary of defense, some of their leading military figures and authorities. I uh, interviewed their military academies. I went to their military bases. Of course, I mean, I now can talk, probably bore you to death, about the Soviet military, although I found it fascinating. One last question. I understand that you're a fanatic at softball. Why is softball so interesting? Well, about 10 years ago, I started to play softball and found that my emotional age was arrested at 14. And since I really do enjoy being at that level, um, I play softball and have played softball every Saturday morning from May 15th to September 15th for the last 10 years with roughly the same group of people. It is a hilarious game. Uh, I can't describe why baseball is such a wonderful game, but it is sensational. And when you see me, as a result of my baseball exploits, advertising used Chevrolets in a tube shirt, you'll know I finally made it. Our thanks to Mort Zuckerman, who is the publisher of U.S. News and World Report. I'm in the office of Donald Graham, publisher of the Washington Post. Don, how do you cover the president and keep your distance from the White House? Does that create any special problems for you? First of all, I mean, a little bit about my job might be helpful to your viewers. I'm not making those daily editing trade-offs, you understand. As publisher of the paper, I've got a more I am not the person making daily editorial decisions, uh, what runs on the front page or, or how close should reporters get to sources or whatnot. But I'm part of the, uh, I talk almost every day with the editors of the paper about that. Ultimately, you must be responsible for overall strategy. I um, certainly am. And uh, the, uh, that's another, that's another right question to be asking. You're one about sources and uh, closeness to them and whatnot. Our, our basic job is to tell uh, what happened yesterday and understand as much as we can of the complexity that went into that. Understanding in turn that uh, the people are constantly trying to mislead us, if you will, or at least tell us a very partial view of the case. Let's say that a, uh, a complicated piece of legislation is uh, up before Congress and the president is pushing a bill and the affected industry is uh, trying to influence key congressmen to change it and whatnot, uh, and that there are several sets of proposed changes. Well, all of those people will be coming to the newspaper reporters covering that story and will be saying, look, Here's what's really going on. Here are the key facts in dispute. Uh, and uh, here's, here's what uh, all these other key players are going to be doing about it. They won't necessarily be lying to you because smart people don't lie to reporters because reporters don't tend to listen to them if they lie. Uh, more than, uh, they, they, they find that out very quickly. Uh, but uh, the reporter then has to be experienced enough and thoughtful enough to understand that there's more than one side to that story to make sure that the reporter touches base with all the sides and listens to everybody's input and then presents to the reader the best they can, a, a balanced and comprehensive picture that puts everybody in perspective. Have you ever received a phone call from a president saying, Don, I don't like the coverage in this area. You've got to shape up. Me personally, from a president, no. Uh, presidents have called various people on the paper. Uh, I can think of a few instances in the past, often on national security issues, asking us not to uh, run stories or whatnot from high-ranking people in administrations, yes. And you always listen. And you try to do what I think you do or what any thoughtful person would do in the situation, try to ascertain the facts, try to find out what it is that uh, somebody's bothered about or upset about, uh, try to find out what it is, in fact, we're proposing to write in a story, see to it if it's accurate, see to it if it's fair, see to it if it does threaten any 
interest. Let, hear everybody out in detail and then make a decision, decide what to do. How do you see the relationship between your paper and government? Are you a check on government? Are you a window for government? What is that relationship? We're a newspaper. We're not part of the government and uh, our job is to do a daily job for the reader and we're not here to make jo government's job easier or harder. By being here, in fact, I suppose uh, people in some governments that would argue we do make their lives harder by, uh, but uh, typically what we're charged with is making inconvenient facts or uh, embarrassing facts available to readers that uh, someone in the government may wish uh, weren't available. And uh, we're not, no, in my, in my view, uh, my view of the newspaper doesn't start with the government one way or the other. It starts with the reader. And we're supposed to tell you what, there is, what we know of importance that went on in the world or in the city or in the community yesterday that's going to affect your life and, and uh, a little bit of what's fun and a little bit of what's uh, entertaining and how the, how the baseball games came out yesterday and who's going to win the fourth race tomorrow. And how do you know whether you're serving your readers well? Is it circulation? Is it profits? Well, it's certainly not profits. Uh, Rupert Murdoch, whom I disagree with on a number of things, once said that uh, in some indefinable way you know whether a newspaper has a fundamental connection with a community, whether it's writing things that whether there is a vibrancy, whether that paper is just going through the motions or whether there's a kind of, uh, whether there's a sense of liveliness, of vitality to that paper that connects it with the uh, people of its community. And uh, uh, you know in a variety of ways, you know by talking to readers, you know to a degree by survey research, although we do not emphasize that greatly. You know by um, readers reaching out to you by mail, by telephone, and telling you that they like or don't like certain things in the paper. And also, you hope you have lots and lots of experienced people working in all the departments of this newspaper who care a lot about it and are doing the same kinds of listening and who have good, the good professional judgment of experienced people. The Washington Post is primarily a family business. The, the paper came into its current ownership in 1933 at a bankruptcy sale. My grandfather bought it at a bankruptcy sale on the steps of an old building about 10, 12 blocks from here. And it was losing a million a year. Uh, and he, he thought that by improving the quality of the paper, you'd sell more papers and then more advertisers would buy ads. And he hoped within three or four years you'd make money. And he was right in general concept and spectacularly wrong in the timing. He lost money for the next 21 years. The legend is that he lost a million bucks a year, which he paid out of his own pocket in 1933 to 54 dollars, which was quite an investment. And he would have been the first to say to you, that being a losing business really limited the extent to which you could be a quality newspaper. It was only after our morning competitor, losing even more than we were, gave up the ghost and sold to us and we began making a little money that we could begin to build a, a quality newsroom and whatnot. So we've tried to, um, we've tried to uh, put money into the uh, we, we've tried to run a good business. We're a publicly held corporation. We're strongly influenced by that. We try to, to run a, it, it is a business and then it's something more. Now the question you asked about um, what, what uh, people now call the culture of the place or whatnot, I wouldn't even begin to know how to describe the, uh, the something as complicated as the newsroom of this place or any other good paper. Let's talk about that a little bit more with two last questions. It's been a rough year with the loss of some employees. When that happens, is there a sense of family, a loss in the family? I'm very much, with all the asterisks and all the qualifying clauses I've given you in the last 20 minutes, I'm very much a romantic and a sentimentalist about newspapers and what they stand for and what they can do. And in that sense, I guess I'm very old-fashioned. 
I think most of us came into this business for uh, because we believed in ultimately the importance of what the, uh, a good newspaper can mean for a community and what the day's news can mean. It is a collaborative process. A whole lot of people have to work together very hard, trusting each other and believe it, and uh, helping each other a lot to make a good newspaper come out. And uh, at its best, there's a very, very strong sense of cohesion to this place because it is what the really wonderful organizations are, which is a lot of people working together on something everybody believes in, arguing like mad about it all the time, but uh, but uh, but but uh, every day coming back, um, caring a lot. How does it feel to lose someone who has taught you some things along the way? It's 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 hard to describe uh, how important. Uh, Leader, the quality of leadership is in an organization and how crucial um, the leadership of people whose names are never on a story or are generally not that well known to the public can be to, to organizations like this one or like most newspapers. And uh, this place has had the great good luck over many years to be run by a few editors who are very principled and uh, who care deeply about the people who worked for them and shared a common set of beliefs with them. And, and uh, you know, as a result of the death of someone like that, it's just devastating. And it's just a, a time of great, great sadness here. But the paper will continue to prosper. Well, the paper will go along just fine, partly because I hope, you know, because one hopes that uh, the values of editors like that got uh, imbued a little bit in, in uh, all the rest of us who are going to keep on working here. Donald Graham, publisher of the Washington Post, and Mortimer Zuckerman, chairman and editor-in-chief of U.S. News and World Report, upon reflection. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org classics.